Well, we're in the week of Sukkot, Tabernacles, and we're just about uh, coming to the end. And I want to talk a little bit about the last day, which is the eighth day of the feast. It's interesting. Uh, did you notice in the Bible that Passover, which is the big holiday in the spring, has seven days? And so the seventh day is another holiday, a sacred assembly. But in Sukkot, which is in the fall, you have seven days, and then you have an eighth day, where the eighth day is the sacred assembly. Do you ever wonder why that was? I'll explain it to you in just a moment or two. Well, anyway, um, one of the things that I want to just remind, the most basic aspect of discipleship is that we want to read and meditate on the Word of God every day. That's rule number one. And I believe we have to, you have to read it in a systematic way. In other words, read it from beginning to end. I, I read it in five parts where I go forward in each section. Come on up. And, um, but you have to read it through every day so that you will know what the Bible is saying in general. There are not specific words in the scriptures. There are general words. These are the words for every human being. But you have to know what these words are before you can know what God is telling to you. So first you have to know what's here. This is as we were talking to release a prophetic anointing upon Susan. We were saying that the first thing you just have to know what's written in this word. You've got to know it very well. And then you'll see in the world that there's two types of thinking. There's thinking that, the type of thinking that comes from God and the type of thinking that comes from the world. And when you begin to recognize those two, then you'll know the type of thoughts that come from God. And then when you get uh, what is revelation or prophecy is just a thought that you get from God. It's just a thought. You say, well, I never thought that before. Boom. And you got it. But you'll know that's the type of thought that comes from God. You don't have to ask the question, e, is that from God or not from God? You'll know that it's not. I mean, if, it's a, if you get a thought about committing adultery, you'll say, but it says, do not commit adultery. I know that's not from God. But then you begin to see the words that are coming from God, and you'll begin to know, therefore, what the specific word is. The scriptures are the general word of God, and a, a revelation or a prophecy is a specific word of God. And all that is, just to remind, to make it easy, is just a thought. What is, uh, what is a revelation? It's just a thought. It's a thought that you never had before. It's a thought that God had and you didn't. As I said, this poor God, he never has any revelations. He knows everything. But when he has one thought that you don't know, it's a mystery. When he gives you that thought, it's a revelation. Nothing is a mystery or a revelation for God. He already knows everything. If he has a thought and you don't, it's a mystery. If he gives you one thought, that's a revelation to you. That's all very simple. They're just thoughts or pictures that come into your heart uh, from God. But you have to know what this word is so that you'll be able to know. Now, one of the things about this holiday, uh, this coming up this eighth day, which in Jewish tradition has, be called, has been come, uh, as known as Simchat Torah, which means the joy of the Torah. Now, that's, that specific expression is not in the Bible, but it actually is very biblical in what it's saying. Why? Because in the biblical command for this day is the command more than any other day in the, in the, in the year that the Bible says over and again, you will rejoice, you will rejoice. You will. This is the day, the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles that the Bible says be joyful and only be joyful. Are you listening? There's no, there's no sadness on that day, which is already, I'll get to that later, but that's already giving you a hint as to why there's eight days in this, in this feast, and I'll tell you that in just a moment. Now, on this day in Jewish tradition, which again is not in the Bible, but I think it's biblical, in, the Jewish people read a little bit of the first section of the Bible, the five books of Moses, the Torah, each week, and you finish it in a year, and on this day is when you read the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy and go back and read the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And then you loop it through every year. The, the people read the, the Torah through the whole year. But I believe we need to read the whole Bible, not just the Torah, but we have to read the prophets, the writings, the gospels, the letters, the book of Revelation. We need to read it systematically in different sections, reading it all the way through. 
because you've got to know where it is. Uh, somebody give me a, an iPhone here for a second. You know, I've noticed today that all the uh, young people have the Bible on their uh, either iPhone or Samsung. Of course, if you're from the East, it'll be Samsung. But anyway, uh, well, if you're from China, it could be HT. But anyway, so, uh, and it's neat that you can pull up verses so fast on it. But there's a danger with that, which is that you don't read it systematically. Right. So, but we have to do both. You, I, I mean, I have, I have the Bible on my, on my uh, Samsung also, but, uh, but I also have one of these here. And the Bible says you have to, Yeshua said that you want to bring out old things and new things to be wise. The old thing is I know the old method. You have to read it straight through, word for word, every day, don't miss. And then you can take these great tools. I got a little concordance on there. You know, you can pop up something. You can jump from place to place. That's good too. I'm not against it. That's a new thing. But you got to do the old thing too. There's no replacement for just going through and reading the Bible all the way through. As a matter of fact, when we first started, we started releasing our team to prophetic gifts. And uh, one time we had a person prophesying a lot in our midst. And something didn't feel right in my tummy. You know what I'm saying when they were prophesying? And I went to them. I said, listen, um, I just want to ask you a question. How's your daily Bible reading going? He said, well, not too good. And I said, you know what? Don't prophesy in our midst anymore. I'm not interested in hearing what you have to say. Because if you aren't doing the work of going through and changing your thought life to be according to the pattern, I don't know, what, I'm not interested in hearing what you're hearing or feeling or getting from God. You know, it might be true. But I don't want to take the chance on it. You know, that's what Bilam did, Balaam. You know, he was just prophesying whatever came to him. But that's another teaching. So we want to believe for... Uh, 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 a steady meditation on the Word of God every day. All the parts of the Bible, you can get your own uh, reading system, but you've got to read the whole thing through consistently. Because if you do that for a number of years, you'll begin to ha have a general idea of basically what's in this book. And you'll know when somebody says something, hey, that's in the book or it isn't in the book. Or that's like it is in the book or it isn't like it is in the book. And you'll begin to know and you can't, and nobody can trick you on it. because you'll Now, for us in Israel, this is very important. Why? Because our rabbis here call Torah things which are not in the Torah. We, they say that there's two Torahs. I don't know if you know this about ultra-Orthodox Judaism. They say that there's two Torahs. One is the, the Torah that we know, and the other is an oral Torah that is a handed down tradition. That's a very dangerous lie and is leading our people uh, into damnation, frankly, from my viewpoint. But you need to know. How would you know? How would you know? If somebody is quoting to you from the scriptures or if somebody is giving you their oral tradition from their denomination, from their church, you got to know what's in this world, folks. When we come in these end times, you better know what's in your covenant. you got to read it through steady, go it all the way through the end, then loop back and read it again. Because also, and you know, a lot of people... Uh, uh, a lot of people, particularly us charismatics, you know, there's some people that go, well, what shall I read today? <laughs> oh, I feel no, maybe this page. No, because then you're going to get confused. You know, you need to know where that is. And if you read it through steadily, you'll see that there's a logic to this book. There's a history to this book. There's a development of thought. The thought pattern goes from the time of the patriarchs into the time of Moses, into the time of the early prophets, which are different from the later prophets, which then leads you into the, new, to the gospels, which then leads you. And there's a, there's a way of thinking that is a progressive revelation from the beginning of this book to the end of this book. Are you listening? And it's not from Genesis to Deuteronomy, as our people do. It's Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. This is what Simcha Torah is supposed to be all about. But for us as believers, we want to know this book. We want to read it systematically, meditate on it, know what it says. Do it in a way that you understand the thinking. I want to say this again. The Word of God progresses from the beginning of Genesis straight on through to the end. Now, here's what's happened with the Bible, is that people from different generations, different men with different backgrounds, different personalities, they wrote the Bible differently in each generation. So if you look at the human style and the literary style of each section, it will all seem different to you. 
That's what you learn in a, in, a, in a university. You learn what's different, and they see no unity of thought in the whole book. But although each writer was different, he each had the same Holy Spirit. So what happens when you read it on a soul, a literary level, all you see is the differences. But when you read it on a spiritual level, you'll begin to see it's the same Holy Spirit telling one story from beginning to end. In fact, it's so amazing because this one story comes through the mouths and the pens of different people in different literary styles, in different generations, in different historical uh, situations which they're all different and then when you read it in the anointing of the Holy Spirit it's all the same so it's all same and different by the way that's what makes for beauty do you know that beauty is diversity unified that's why a rainbow is so beautiful that's harmony you have different sounds working together a rainbow you have different colors unified if you just have different colors but no unity you just have a mess or if you have different sounds going on, that's just noise. But And if you had a rainbow, if it was all one color, would that be very beautiful? No. The dip, what makes beauty is diversity harmonized. Whether it's in a symphony, whether it's in a rainbow, but even more so in the Word of God. And also we, we, for us in the Israel and the church, the ecclesia, as we come together, there's diversity in harmony. You feel that today. Isn't this beautiful for us to be together today? So we're talking about on Simcha Torah, I'm trying to give a spiritual understanding of this idea that we go back, finish the book of Deuteronomy, and start over again in the book of Genesis. We believe in systematic meditation on the Word of God every day. Let me just also, one more point on how this goes. You want to read it through and concentrate with your mind, with your soul. You've got to think you got to ask yourself, what is this saying? You need to understand what's written before you can get a spiritual revelation out of it. You, you understand it with your mind. And then you stop and you just start to think. You let, you, let, you let yourself be taught. You begin to meditate. First you have to read and study, and then you begin to meditate. And you just let someone else, which is the Holy Spirit, begin to teach you on the inside the meaning of the words. You have to know what the words are first, and then the Holy Spirit can begin to give you understanding of that. So you first read, and then meditate, and then you get a general direction, and then you begin to pray in the Spirit to get even more specific direction. And then you begin to hone in. Are you listening to me? And you've got to focus right into the point of absolute obedience. You've got to, from reading the, book, the scriptures to meditation, to praying in the Holy Spirit, to praying for specific, you've got to push it to the point where you say, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be You've got to push your will into that focus point where you're going to, if God tells you, you will do the exact thing that you least want to do in your entire life. At that point, you've got to obey. If all this process doesn't lead up to absolute obedience, you will miss what it has. You know, we know we're all getting the benefits. The Holy Spirit, eternal life, grace, forgiveness of sins. And all that came because one man, his name was Yeshua. Jesus, the Son of God, who came and he pressed himself into the will of God and said, I will obey at all costs, not my will. And it was hard for him. His closest friends left him. One betrayed him. One ran away. Heaven fell asleep. You know, there nobody was with him. And he said, you see how hard he prayed to obey. And because he went all the way and obeyed, even to the point of death, that released the power of God. And I believe in every revival around the world, if you take it back, you'll find somebody that was willing to obey God, even unto the death. That's where, that's, where it, that's where the will of God hits the point of faith. Are you with me? You know, as some people say, quote that verse in the Bible that says, uh, <clears throat> the most important thing, of course, for God is that you feel good. Right? Where is that in the scripture? It's not in there. 
I heard that quoted more than any other verse in the Bible. It's not in there. All right, so anyway, what we're talking about is steady meditation on the Word of God, praying to the point of obedience, of faith, and then that releases the power and the will of God. That's what, that's what we believe. Now, one of the things uh, that we have a kind of a joy here in reading is that most of us here read a reconstructed Hebrew version of the New Testament. Along with that, of course, the original in the, in the Old Testament is all in Hebrew. So what happens is that you begin to see a lot of associations from the Old Testament to the New Testament that you might not see in a, when, when it's translated, because for some reason they translate it differently. Did you know, for instance, the word Anna in, in um, foreign language is the same as the name is Hannah in the original Hebrew? So I was just praying for somebody here named Hannah. Here you are. That, that, you know, when you go back to the book of 1 Samuel, that first woman that began to pray and intercede, the mother of Samuel, her name was Hannah. That's the same name as the woman in the book of Luke that was praying for the birth of Yeshua. See, it's not Hannah and Anna. It's Hannah. They're both Hannah. And, and you begin to see the connection of all these things. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you, did you ever notice that in, a, in, a, uh, in the New Testament that... Uh, um, uh, Peter is preaching and someone comes into his congregation named Ananias and he lies and drops down dead. Well, his name isn't Ananias, his name is Hanania. And there's somebody in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the prophets, and one of the prophets was teaching and he lied, somebody named Hanania, and he also died, the same thing, the same name. Somebody dying on the spot on prophecy. Isn't that amazing? So you begin to see a steady flow. And what, what that helps you to see, now you don't need to know Hebrew to do that. The point what I'm trying to say is that the book, the more you read this book, you begin to realize that it has a unified theme from beginning to end because that's connected with this holiday. It has a, big, a unified theme from beginning to end. And you begin, as you read it through over the years, you'll begin to see the same picture beginning to emerge and it'll all begin to make sense. You with me so far? Let me give you another example of that. If you noticed that the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, speak of a paradise. If you go to the last two chapters of the Bible, hallelujah, they also of, of, um, of um, Revelation uh, 21 and 22 speak also of paradise restored. It's the, exact, it's the exact same language. You see, it starts out with God's purposes to create a perfect world. And then it gets destroyed by sin, but then God restores it, restores it, restores it until you get back to the very end. So you have a perfect unity from the first word of the Bible all the way to the end of the Bible. If you go the third chapter in from the, from the beginning, it's where Satan overcomes the human race and knocks them into sin and death. And if you go to the third chapter from the end of the Bible, you see that the devil is overcome and thrown into, it and thrown into the pit. Hallelujah. So we see that there's a perfect formation and unity of this word from beginning to end. And when you realize that people wrote it in different generations with different personalities, in different parts of history, with different backgrounds it's amazing that it all fits together yeah. wow yeah. what a wonderful thing and that's part of the meaning of this holiday simchat torah that we believe in meditating on the scriptures from beginning to end now the other thing we need the second thing we need to realize this is that the the things that we call holy days or feasts of Israel, there's another word in Hebrew, of course, which is called uh, mo'adim, which means appointed times is a nice way to translate. It's actually the same root, if you know, from Amos chapter 3, when it says, God says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Actually, what the Hebrew says there is, how can two meet together if you don't make an appointment? If you don't make an appointment to meet someone, how can you walk with him? So that word appointment there is the same. How can they be agreed or make an appointment is the root of the word mo'adim for peace, these, uh, for the feast. These are appointed times of God. You know, you get mixed up. You say these are Jewish feasts. Well, they just happen to be Jewish feasts because our people happen to be there at the time when God gave it. They're biblical feasts, okay? These are the times that God set in the scriptures. Are you listening to me? Now, not only that, but that same word, Moadim, the Lord is speaking right now. Can you hear it? That, that, that same word, Moadim, for the feast is also in, in the beginning of, of the book of Genesis when God said God created the stars in the sky for appointed 
recorded times. This was way before this was two, three thousand years before the people of Israel ever got started. These, uh, these appointed times are built in to God's creation. It's his purpose, his creation, his time schedule, his feast, his heart, and all this, all these things have symbolic meaning. That's what's kind of sad for our people. And I say this in love, but our people that are, are so focused on every little detail of the holidays, you know why? Because they don't have a revelation of the meaning of it yet. And so what happens is the symbol becomes more important. The symbol becomes of eternal importance. And we're saying, no, no, the symbol points to something. The symbol itself is, is a little bit more flexible. You have to ask yourself, what is it pointing to? That's what we want to understand. But then, in the, but then I would say in the Christian world, if you don't see the pattern of prophecy established in these appointed times, you're just going to start prophesying in everything in wrong direction. And you think you've got the meaning, but you might not have the meaning. So you have, to have, you have to have the meaning and the symbol that causes the pattern, and then you have the meaning in the right time and direction. Are you with me? It says, in, it says for instance, in, a, in the book of Proverbs, that a word spoken in its season is like apples in a framework of silver, apples of gold in a framework of silver. So the content is the gold, but you have to get the framework right, which is also the silver. So this just gives you the framework on it. Now, what we see is that there are two main sets of holidays in the Bible, three in the spring and three in the fall. Although, although our tradition says that this is the beginning of the year, it's not. The beginning of the year is in the spring. The spring holidays come first, and then you have the fall holidays. There's two groups of holidays. And why is that? Because there are two primary moves of the Messiah in history. One already happened 2,000 years ago, and one is about to happen. And it's interesting to note that the three great events of the first coming of Jesus, which was his crucifixion, his resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all happened at the timing of the three spring holidays. He was crucified at Passover. He was raised at the beginning of first fruits. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Feast of Weeks at Pentecost. Now, when I say that wouldn't it make sense if that was the case for the first coming, isn't it likely that his second coming is connected to the fall feasts? If his first coming is connected with the spring feast, wouldn't it make sense that his second coming is connected with the fall feasts? Well, that's what we believe. God first established his pattern in the feasts. And then he explained, that's in the Torah, and then he explained it in the prophets, and then he fulfills it in the new covenant. It's totally consistent. And when you see that, you see a steady thought from the, the 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 holy appointed times of the Torah priesthood with the words of the prophets of Israel, and then the fulfillment in Yeshua, then it all begins to make sense. It all fits in together. Are you with me there? So what we say is, in the end times, there will be. <laughs> three major events. You've got the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, and you have the millennial kingdom. Those three things are connected with the three fall holidays. The trumpets is with the tribulation, the second coming is with the day of atonement, and the millennial kingdom is with tabernacles. How do we see that? We say, well, the feast of trumpets. I don't see what that could have anything to do with end times tribulation, could it? Trumpets don't have anything to do with end times tribulation, do they? Oh, wait a minute. In the book of Revelation, all of the tribulations of the end time are connected with the blowing of a trumpet. How do you like that? God tricked us, huh? So that's a, the trumpets are the, tr the trumpets of the day of trumpets. The day of trumpets is the holy day to get ready for the blowing of the trumpets of tribulation in the end times. And then you have the great day of the Lord, which is the Yom Kippur, the second coming of Yeshua, which in the midst of a great war and the nations attack Israel, just like they did on the Day of Atonement in 1973. God was getting our people ready. It was a time to get us ready for the second coming. That's what's going to happen. All the nations of the world are going to attack. And then this time the Lord will come. And then you have tabernacles, which is 
Why are all the nations of the world here to come and celebrate and rejoice? Because that's a figure of the millennial kingdom, which it says, of course, in Zechariah 14, verse 16. It says that after the Lord comes back, that the nations of the world will come up and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The tabernacles is the symbol of that thousand-year millennial kingdom after Yeshua comes back. Three holidays in the fall, in the spring, three holidays in the fall. One has already happened with the first coming. One is yet to happen with the second coming. It all works out in the perfect plan of God. Hallelujah. Now, on this day, God says to rejoice. Now, it says this, in, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. It says on this holiday, you need to rejoice and only rejoice. Only rejoice. There will be no sadness on this day. Can anybody tell me another place in scriptures that you recall that it said there will be no more sadness, that there will only be joy? Where is that? Yes, dear. Yeah, what chapter do you remember? 21, that's right. What happens that? What happens on that day? It's the new creation. It's the new creation. Oh, watch this. Passover is seven days. The biblical pattern is one day for a thousand years. The seventh day, now you've got to listen closely. I'm just going to say this. It might be hard for you to get, but I just want to get it recorded. In the first coming, is talking about the 7,000-year history of mankind. The end of the sixth day is the second coming of Yeshua. And the seventh day, the 7,000 year, is the millennial kingdom on earth. That's what's being described in the Passover seven days. You with me? Six days of the 6,000 year history of mankind. The seventh day of Passover is a Sabbath, which is the millennial kingdom. The 7,000 year. One day equals 1,000 years. That's the meaning of the Sabbath, which is interpreted when Jesus comes the first time and you understand what will happen. But when you come to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is speaking of the future that hasn't happened yet, you have eight days. Oh, what happens after seven? You start over. That's when you get a new creation. So listen, is it becoming obvious to you? You know what I'm going to say right now? The seventh day Sabbath of the Passover seven days represents the millennial kingdom, not the new creation. The eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles represents the new creation, not the millennial kingdom. And when you get to the new creation, that is the time that there is no sadness at all. It's just total joy. Everything's been created anew. And that's why God said all the way back in the Torah, when you celebrate this one day, the eighth, the eighth day, the Shmini Atzeret, that you will have only joy on that day on that day because it represents sim symbolically the eighth thousandth year of history which is at the end of the millennium the beginning of the new creation when God will wipe away the tear from every eye and there will be no more pain or sadness for the rest of creation is this uh, does not seem totally simple and clear and that's when you understand the pattern of scriptures of just keep but just keep reading it until it becomes to make, to make clear on what we're going to do. Now, what that means is that, it, well, Asher, what are you saying? If we look at Passover, if you're saying each day equals a thousand years, then, in the biblical symbolism, then you're saying we're getting close to the seventh day Passover, uh, Sabbath, which will be the millennial kingdom. And then you're saying on Sukkot, after that, there's on the eighth day, there's a time of perfect, perfect joy. So are you trying to tell me that yet to come, there will be a thousand year period time of a Sabbath, and then there'll be another period of time after that of perfect joy? Is that what we're saying? Yes or no? Yes, it is. It's exactly what it says at the end of the book of Revelation. It says that Jesus comes back in Revelation 19. In Revelation 20, there's a thousand year period of his reign. And then in 21 and 22, there's a time of eternal happiness. That's what we're, it's all, it's all pre-prepared by God. It's an amazing thing that all fits together in the scriptures. So we want to be able to read the Bible all together 
And now let me just end with this. So we're also saying this. The tabernacles now, during this week, is, is the, the whole Feast of Tabernacles, the seven days, is equal to the seventh day of the day of Passover. It's representative of the millennial kingdom. I just want to make sure you understand this. Jesus is going to come back soon. Okay? Before he comes back, there's going to be a time of difficult tribulation upon the earth. A lot of difficulty. But... At that time will also be the time of the greatest miracles, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the greatest time of world evangelistic harvest in the history of mankind. That's when it all happens. And if somebody tells you that you're not going to be here for that time, get out and don't ever listen to their teachings again. Because we're coming into the greatest time of spiritual battle in the history of mankind. Yes, there will be difficulty. Yes, there will be persecution. Yes, it will be suffering, but it's also the time of greatest evangelism, greatest miracles, the greatest glory of the church, the reconciliation of Israel and church, the harvest of the end times leading up to the second coming of Jesus. And you don't want to be there? Come on! Now, there's no way, in a, in a, it just even in a small group of this, of charismatics, that this isn't offending somebody right down to your socks. If it is, you know, just think about it. You can come up to me afterwards. But I just want to mention this to you. Listen. Maybe it's offending most of you. I don't care. But listen, I just want to tell you something. You go back and check it for yourself. You go back and check it for yourself. Listen to me. There are seven direct citations of the rapture. In the New Testament, seven direct passages, okay? Two in Matthew 24, one in Mark 13, one in Luke 17, one in 1 Corinthians 15, one in 1 Thessalonians 2, and one in, one in 1 Thessalonians 4, and one in 2 Thessalonians 2. In every single one of those passages, there is a time reference. You go back and check it. In every single one of them, it says it's not until after the tribulation, until after the appearance of the, of the, of the man of evil, until after the resurrection of the dead. It does not happen until after. That's in every single one of the seven. So maybe I'm wrong. But you've got to find out. You've got to, but you've got to show me enough scriptures to back it up. And I've heard people say, oh, you're wrong. You don't understand, Asher? Between this verse and this verse is when the whole church gets raptures. You mean it's not there? No, no, well, it's, it's in between those verses here. Don't you see it? Come on now. And I want to tell you something. To think that God doesn't want his people to suffer. I mean, I would only, I mean, excuse me, I'm also half American, you know? I mean, do you have to be American to come up with a theology like that? You people here from China, the greatest revival in the history of man uh, until today, until this day. Go tell the Chinese church that, oh, no, God doesn't want you to suffer. Well, of course he doesn't want you to suffer. That's why he's making a perfect world with no suffering in it. But to bring the kingdom of God of light into a place where there's evil and darkness, you've got to be willing to confront it. And, of course, there's going to be friction and there's going to be attack. If you're not getting persecuted, what are you pushing back on the devil on? I better close. Anyway, what I wanted to say was that what, when Jesus comes back, there will be a time where he will be here for a thousand years. It's not the perfect world. It's the messianic kingdom. It's the last transition for a thousand years. The perfect world comes at the end of that time. There's a thousand years here where he, Jesus, rules over the world, peace and prosperity from Jerusalem on a worldwide kingdom. Hallelujah of unity. Israel and the church together were there, but there'll still be free will. People will still be sinning. There'll be problems there. And, but it actually, there, he re, what I want to say this is that he's really going to come back. He's going to come all the way back. His feet are going to come down and touch on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to come across after the war. And he's going to come in and sit in Jerusalem. And he's going to rule there for a thousand years. And if what you're hearing is the second coming is that he comes halfway back and goes back up again, I can't find that anywhere. That's not what it says. He comes all the way back. And if you don't believe there's going to be a real kingdom of Yeshua upon this earth, I don't know what Bible you're reading. 
Because if you go to the end of almost every one of the prophets of Israel, when you get to the end, it describes a kingdom of peace on this earth with the Messiah ruling over this earth from his capital in Jerusalem. And if you don't believe that, in my viewpoint, you're believing in Hinduism and not Christianity. That'll be enough for us today. Hallelujah. Uh, you can write me some bad postcards. It's all right. But let's pray. Let's stand up and pray, and we'll uh, end here. Hallelujah. But folks, I'm not just teaching this. I, listen, we need to work together. We're about to come into the greatest set of spiritual warfare and battles this world has ever seen. But what I want to say, oh, and this was, I forgot the main point of the messages. Are you still recording this? You got to get this recorded. Put that back on. And that is that, folks, we have a good ending. We have a happy ending. Read the end of the book. Yeah, we're going to have to go through hell to get there. But the end of the book is a happy ending. We have an expression in the Hebrew that says, uh, sof tov kol tov. And it says, when the, if the ending is good, then everything's good. And I want to tell you this. We have read the end of the book. It's a good ending. Everything works out perfectly in the end. We win. God wins. It's perfect happiness. Paradise on the earth. A perfect world with perfect people. It's all good news. And you know what? If you don't read this Bible all the way to the end, you don't have a happy ending. The happy ending's only at the end. You know what I'm saying? Think how sad our people is. They read the Old Testament and they never get to the part where you have a happy ending. So our people are, are fighting off depression like crazy and worry and anxiety. So we never see that you ever get to the good end. The Bible, the Bible, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets does not have an ending. There's only two ways to end it. It's either in the Mishnah or it's in the, in the New Covenant. And so people say, well, how would you know? I said, take two hours. Read, read both of them. See what it would be obvious. You know, The law and the prophets don't come to an end. The good ending is when you read the new covenant. And that's what this day, this holiday, is all about to remind us that this whole problem and plan has a good ending for it. And we know it now in our hearts. We can be joyful now in hope because we already know what comes at the end. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for restoring hope to your people in these end times.